speaker's wait. So uh, my name's Brett Mills. Welcome to this uh, session of the final week of the CST conference, this session on TV. What TV? Question mark. Nice, uh, intriguing title for the panel. Um, and we have two speakers today, uh, Katie Moylan from the University of Leicester and anne Katrine Bieber from the University of Basel. Um, I'm sure you all know the structure now, but just in case anybody's new to this stuff, uh, the way we'll do this. So papers are 20 minutes and we'll take both papers first and then discussion afterwards. During the papers, if you've got comments, responses, questions, please do feel free to put those in the chat and I'll pick those up um, at the end. Uh, cameras off during the papers, I think that's fine because all of you have got cameras off already. But at the end, when we get to the discussion, if you're willing and able to put your camera back on, that's nice for the speakers so they've got actual faces to speak to. Um, and with that, uh, I'll pass over to Katie for the first paper, which is about teaching and TV studies, I believe, Katie. Over to you. It is indeed. Sorry, Thank Sorry before you start, um, can I ask everyone to mute themselves as well, please, other than obviously the speaker? Thank you. Thanks, Elke. Thanks. OK, um, before I start the paper itself, I want to ask a couple of questions, and if you could answer just by raising your hands. Um, how many of you guys are teaching or are regular teaching TV yourselves? OK, cool. Yes. Great. OK, yay. Great stuff. Great stuff. OK, OK. So what that means is for many of you, what I'm about to say might sound blindingly obvious therefore, but at the very least, hopefully we can generate some discussion of shared good practice maybe, okay? And my second question is how many of you guys are watching or are familiar with Stranger Things in particular this current season? Nice one. Okay, great, great, okay. So some of you are, um, because I'm going to play a clip which will contain a spoiler, um, but uh, that's not the reason I'm playing it, but I just wanted to get a sense of how familiar you guys are with this. Okay, so with no ado, I am going to share this. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great. Yes, we can. Wonderful, thank you so much. Okay. OK, so yes, what are we teaching when we're teaching TV studies? Uh, when I first thought of this abstract and wrote it with a lot of energy in January. Um, it was the start of term and I was very struck by my students in the room. It's a core module for second year undergraduates for media and communication students here at Leicester. And I was very struck that they were all watching different things and that they also had feelings about how they were experiencing TV during the pandemic. So that's where I started from. I found that really interesting and I also found that our sense of televisual te televisuality had changed and morphed as indeed it tends to do and as it has always done, but maybe the pandemic has accelerated our sense of this. So I started with them and I'm starting with this today um, from this piece by Lynn Joyrich, which she actually wrote for the LA Times, kind of knee deep in the first lockdown. I think it was like spring of 2020. And what I liked about this is she identifies, again, what's familiar to us, the way that television can morph and shift. It can be intensely private, but can also be very public, both in our experience, but also in what we see on TV, right, in terms of, say, quiz shows, etc. But also I loved this uh, observation of hers of the ways in which television was connecting us, because I think that was very intimately and intensely true for many of us. And of certainly for me. So I brought that reflexivity into my discussions with students as well. And in this sense, Kathy Johnson's findings on the COVID-19 research they had been doing and how that had shifted viewing practices was so interesting to me. And I just think there should be more of that. But it also dovetailed with what I was finding out from my students. So that was the moment that we're starting from, say, theoretically. Um, she also makes the observation that this expanded televisuality is her term has been accelerated in terms of form, right? So YouTube has been morphing, as we know, through both channels, but also other ways of production-led content. But then, of course, now today there's TikTok, not just today. So the form itself is morphing. So it's morphing in terms of our experience and it's morphing in terms of form. So what I wanna do with this paper is talk about how I mobilize, encourage individual student reflexivity, given that they're all watching different things. Um, because this is a way for them to understand their viewing practices um, and to make those practices strange, but also legitimate them, right? Because they are a set of cultural practices which are chosen, even if it feels subcon 
subconscious, even if it feels like something, they're just collapsing into their couch or their bed at the end of the day. As we all know, those choices are still conscious. So I developed two assessments for this module. The first, this portfolio is 30% and I introduce it early and ask for an early deadline. And that's to really put their feet to the floor to start thinking about those practices as practices. This is from the assessment. It's a lot of questions. I won't read through them and it prompts a lot of questions from them in turn, but it's really to jumpstart that process by them of what even is it to watch TV? What even is TV? And this too um, brought up quite early on some conversations around does YouTube count as TV? Does TikTok? And again, these questions around medium specificity and form I think are so important because as a child of linear TV, you know, my sense of TV, and I think we've talked about this, any of us who teach TV, the kind of disconnect between those of us, my generation and younger people who don't watch TV on TV and don't have a problem with that for one example. So this assessment is designed to get them thinking about the TV that they watch and think about the decisions they make. Now this generated a lot of questions in terms of how to write this kind of assessment uh, because it is reflective. They bring in uh, analytical perspectives, ideas from the reading in their essay, which is 70%. So that's very, that's a traditional form of assessment. But what I hope happens with this, and I think was born out this year, is it really focuses them on TV in terms of its emotional resonance. And that in turn, I think gave their engagement with it on the page a greater depth. You know, they, they kind of felt how important TV was, if I'm putting that in a way that makes sense, that isn't too qualitative. So this is where I start them off as a reflective assignment, okay, to kind of get them thinking about this. And what's not clear here is it's a 700 word assignment and they're discouraged from using readings, but when they identify their television practices and their chosen TV, they must tell us its formal qualities. What form or format is it? What kind of genre? Uh, what country it comes from, production details, this kind of thing. Okay, so what does this then mobilize? What does this kind of reflexivity enable? So back to the pandemic, what I thought, and I think I may have said this, but what I think was really important was the way in which recognition of our connection with television during viewing um, was emotional. And we always have watched TV for emotional reasons, you know, for comfort viewing, this kind of thing, maybe to feel better about ourselves. But I think emotion became foregrounded. Um, and what came up in the discussion around TV as value um, last week in that conversation, I know Kathy Johnson said in the comments, we're talking about what is value. And value was embodied in her findings by the emotion produced, right, by feelings. And I think kind of recognizing that is just useful for us because then in turn, what that encourages students to do is like connect the feelings they have with the TV to formal components like genre, um, like thematic preoccupations, like character, which enables them in turn to have a much more focused analysis because they're invested, I feel. So what also happens is in this process, they're encouraged to recognize their positionality um, and the ways in which their situated knowledges come to their TV viewing choices. So in Leicester, we have a very, as in a lot of UK universities, but uh, we have a really diverse undergraduate student cohort. So of those 40 students, um, we have a, most of them, by which I mean two thirds, are say English, but of the ones from England, uh, they themselves are diverse. So they're black, they're white, they're Asian, and they come from Midland cities, but also a fair lot of them come from London. So already there's a diversity in British experiences in the classroom. We also have maybe a fourth of our students uh, are Chinese, mainland Chinese, but also Hong Kong. And then we still have a scattering of Erasmus students. So all those different perspectives are coming into the room. That means that you have that much more diversity in forming their viewing choices, okay? So what I really like about Sarah Ahmed's work in terms of how to negotiate the academy from our positionality, and in particular, people who are negotiating the academy from positionalities which are not recognized, right, are not interpolated as, say, the mainstream normative university white middle class student of the UK, ways in which these experiences can also be mobilized in viewing experiences and choices. We use our particulars to challenge the universal. And from this then, so whilst just making these decisions about what to watch, students in turn consider their positionality as positionality. So I'm going to digress for a second to um, the conversation we had with the value as TV uh, panel 
And Brett mentioned uh, the ways in which some prestige dramas kind of, he didn't like them. I, I think that's fair to say, because I think you made that point several times. And as you're speaking, I agree. I didn't like them either. And I was trying to figure out in that moment, why not? Because I otherwise like serial drama very much. But something about UK, in particular English drama, leaves me cold. And it made me freshly realize, because if you teach UK TV, you, this is throughout anyway, questions of representation, inequity of representation, and so on. But I realized anew that these kind of dramas really situate a white upper middle class positionality and it leaves everyone else by the side. And so there's nothing there to resonate for me. So if that doesn't resonate for me, how much less might it not resonate for my students? As one example, as one example of how these um, different forms of TV interpolate us, because they all do, right? And here I bring in Stuart Hall's lovely idea, which I always go back to and think of teaching. You know, why do we care? What are we made to think about and to critique when we're thinking about where we're coming from, how we're approaching these media texts. And this, of course, is an idea that any of us who teach cultural studies, media studies, you know, it's, it's in the room, but this is what we're teaching. We're teaching points of critique and how to develop critique. So problem-based, what is the problem? What is the problem in representation? What do we need to in investigate? Okay, so it's a lot for one assignment to do, but I hope it jumpstarts their thinking in terms of their critical reflexivity. They are second years, so some of these ideas are already there, but I hope, um, and I, I see it play out actually this year, um, that this assignment went, that they went that much further. So certain genres appeal to people from different uh, nations, regions, backgrounds, etc. Okay, so in turn then, um, what I want to do is focus on one uh, interpretive formal device called the televisual moment, which will be familiar to you guys. Um, and building on this, actually I, I skipped a bit, which I'm going to get to in a second. I see the televisual moment as one of many formal components that we can focus our teaching on. So as we start to unpack week by week, we look at things like genre, we look at representation, we look at format, we look at aesthetics, and we look at the different ways in which television creates and produces meaning, right? We look at characters, we look at societal values. Uh, what I feel the televisual moment, and again, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, enables is a particular kind of analysis that allows us to encapsulate um, that critique within a particular moment. A televisual moment can do a lot of work. So for first principles, um, which I really feel this panel, what is TV, gets at for both my paper and the one following mine. It's like, what is TV in the biggest sense? Of first principles, let's look at the moment, building on John Ellis's idea of the segment. This blurb is taken directly from one of the new books by Jonathan Bignall and Sarah Cardwell. I have not read them, but I'm very conscious that they really unpack the moment as moment. What I like about this quote is it takes the moment as beyond its textual properties and recognizes it as an impactful turning force. That is very much what I've always thought is a televisual moment to be as well. So I like that they're bringing that to bear. And the only reason I'm not quoting more from the book is because I haven't read it yet. What I'd like to do now is show one of these moments. Elka, if you could put it, there's, you can ignore all these links aside from the learning on screen one. This is about five minutes and it's from a program called Gogglebox, um, which is arguably an example of cheap TV, reality TV. It's something I showed to my students for the first time on week one to show them what is even TV. So I think I'll show this if we can get it working and then unpack it a bit and then wrap up then. Um, Caitlin, you just have to stop sharing yourself for me. To Got it. To the... Okay, bear with, excuse me. All right, and I need to go back into Teams to do that. Here we are, there we go. How's okay. that? Thanks. That's great, thank you. I uh, hope you can see this. That looks good. That as well. Max. Elko, we can't see you. Or I can't. Oh, the eyes have gone. We can oh hear God. it. We can hear it, but we can't see it, Elko. Oh. 
Where did Elka go? Probably. Oh, here she's back. Here we go. What we oh. apologies. I'm I'm going to be with you in a second. I'm just hitting okay. the wrong pages. That's all. It's okay. <laughs> it's the kind of thing that happens to me all the time. So I just I've just passed over the hat to you. Thank you for this. Okay. So, hey, I think, I think we're there. Yeah. There we go. Thank you, Elka. You I want to be a teenager in this town. Absolutely not. With that Vecna about. Trouble. Terrorizing them. Most Max. This is her brother's grave. Dark. It's getting dark. Oh, this isn't good. Oh, no, Tom. Oh, she's gone no, in the upside she's down. She's gone in the upside down now. What would happen at the graveyard as well? Max. Max. Ooh. Oh, the eyes have gone. Oh, my God. Oh, no, they know. They know something's wrong. How can they get her out of the trance? What do, what do they do? Oh, oh, no, oh, no, oh no, 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 Oh, it's that thing again. Vecna. It is time. Max. I'm not looking. Time for you. To join me. No. No, not Max. Join me. That just means I. So once you're done, you're done, aren't you? She's not getting out of this, is she now? What's he looking for? I know. What are those tapes? What's he going to do with the tapes? So I wonder if they can stop this. Well, that's what they're going to try and do, aren't they? He's obviously looking for something. Stop it. Hey, I can hear you. What, what is this? A song. What's your favorite song? Oh, what are they going to do? Like, come drop some memories to bring her back. What's her favorite song? What's her favorite song going to be in the 80s? Obviously, they've clocked. If you play one of their favorite songs, it might take them out of the upside down world. Mm. What are you doing in here, Max? Oh, my God, this is what's happening in her mind. Yeah, this is what she thinks is going on. Mm. Oh! oh. Oh my God! What's right around the leg? Oh no 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 oh, no 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 no, 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 no. She's done. She's reeling her in. Ah! Wait! She's... Oh my God! It's gonna strangle her against the tree. Oh, that's not very nice. Oh, she's a goner. <gasps> she can't oh. die. She can't die. She can't die. <laughs> oh, come on, quickly, kids! Find her song. These three of Oh my god, Black Eddie, tune on, come on. I'll have me up and play a fucking song for God's sake. Kate Bush? Yes. Kate Bush? Hurry up, put in the music, man! Now! Kate Bush can get you out of there. Kate will get you out of it, don't you worry. No, I can't even dance, too stressful. Running up that hill? Shoo! <gasps> hey, check out the portal! It's a portal! It worked! But how's she going to get away from that? Well, she's got to get out. Kate Bush will help her. Oh, oh, look at them fingers, man! No, when they start floating off into the sky! Oh. She's a god. This is so intense, man. Oh, no, she's going! She's going. Grab her, grab her! Help her! Oh, she's remembering all the good times. Come on, Max. Just remember the lovely fun times oh, you had with yes. those sweet people. I hope this isn't her life flashing before her eyes. Oh, come on. I'm actually going to cry. Come on. I've got time to move. <laughs> Yeah! She's ripped his neck out. Go on, girl. Come on, come on, get up, get up. Just focus on that gap. Run! Come on, Max. Run, 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 run! Oh, no, no, no! He's trying to lick her down with boulders from the sky. No! Back, back! She ain't gonna make She's it. She's got to jump. 
go on, Max, you're so close. Good. Go on, throw yourself through. She'll Just get there, dive, she'll get dive, there. Dive, dive, dive. She'll get there, she can see herself. What? Oh. Is that it? Oh, God, I can't bear it. She, she can't die. She can't die. <laughs> yes! She's, She's back. back. She's, She's back. back. Bring you down. Come back down. Did it. Oh, my God. Oh. They've got her safe. Was that enough? You muted. You're muted. Uh, there's a yeah, I hadn't given you an end point. Uh, so yeah, but that's I think that summarizes a fair bit. Um, thank you very much, Elka. Can everyone see my my slide again? Yeah, you're back. Wonderful, thanks. Okay, so. Obviously, it's a very emotional moment and anyone living in the UK will be familiar because that has been also credited for jumpstarting uh, or, or for re, uh, remember, reminding everyone how awesome that song by Kate Bush is and old, old people are like, wow, yay, younger generation are discovering this. That is all true. But what I really love about that moment is it, it's so emotional. <laughs> I find it very emotional. Um, the first, the, the moment itself from Stranger Things is itself emotional and it does what Matt Hills, what Jason Jacobs um, um, have described that a televisual moment can do, which is to say it brings forward more than what's happening. It's more than just about exposition. It is something complete in itself, um, but it references the larger whole. But what you also get here in that production of emotion is you have the layer of Gogglebox. So this is actually from Celebrity Gogglebox about three weeks ago. Um, some of you may recognize the celebrities, some of you may not. <laughs> Um, but what I love about Gogglebox newly is that for students, it shows all these people in their viewing practices um, on their couches, always on their couches, eating snacks or not eating snacks or ignoring snacks and responding very viscerally. And in this clip in particular, particular the emotional responses of the various um, celebrity viewers were also kind of meaningful. And I just think that extra layer helps us help students see that there is more than one way to negotiate a scene in a way. And it is actually that simple. That is what that moment does. But that is also what Gogglebox does, which makes it useful as a kind of show. But it also highlights very early on what is a televisual moment and how we can use this as a unit of analysis uh, when writing essays as your textual example. But also they will hit us as viewers. So when something hits us emotionally, how then do we talk about it critically, right? How can we frame that? in our critical work. And that's really where I'm going to end it because I feel very strongly and reflect a lot on my own TV watching and I bring that into class. And I want to talk to you guys about how we can do that productively as people who teach TV. And that's me. Thanks. Thank you, Katie. Um, and perfect timing as well. Um, so that's really good uh, too. Lots to talk about there. As I said earlier, if you've got questions, comments, responses, if you want to put those in the chat now, and I'll come back to those after the next talk. Uh, and with that in mind, we'll pass over to uh, Anne Katrin Weber from the University of Basel. So I'll pass over to you, Anne Katrin. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm the tone and the topic will shift rather <laughs> radically so no emotions unfortunately in my talk and I turn to a historical topic and so I won't I share my screen and I won't see you anymore so if there is any trouble you should just make some noise so now um, do you see my well fine yeah, we okay good so yeah, thank you very much um, for this invitation and thank you for being present um, this afternoon. 
Um, I start by saying that I was actually really happy to discover the overall topic of um, this year's CTS conference, since this question of outliers or margins in television studies is something that interests me actually very much in my own research. And even more, the title of the panel, What TV? Question mark points actually directly to the topic that I like to discuss, but which again is rather diff different from what we've just have seen, which also shows this broad, um, <laughs> the, the broadness of television, obviously. So what I want, I would like to talk uh, today or discuss today um, is part of the ideas that I am currently developing with regard to this long history of televisual closed circuits. Um, today, Closed circuits images are everywhere, you know them. We use them for our conference calls, for Zoom teachings, Teams teachings, for telemedicine consultations, video surveillance. Less visible but no less impactful are closed circuits for facial recognition, policing and drone warfare. The real-time view of distant things and people through closed circuits is part of our digital societies. However, despite their pervasive nature, the multiform closed circuits have received little scholarly attention and their history is virtually forgotten today. And so it is this history that interests me in my current project. Distributed under the name of industrial television or CCTV, closed circuit systems were developed from the 1930s on in the USA and in Europe by enterprises active in television R&D. And uh, for instance, we can mention RCA, uh, Philips or Pi in Europe. Uh, so these are all um, manufacturers who also were engaged in research on domestic TV. In its most basic organization, CCTV connected a camera with a monitor by cable. More sophisticated designs allowed for the video recording of content or bidirectional conversation. So while CCTV today stands as a synonym of the surveillance camera, its historical applications were at least as diverse as contemporary closed circuits. <coughs> and yes. Oh, sorry, I was just um, coughing. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> okay. So the historical applications included military applications in form of teleguided bombs and missiles. And what you see here is um, the images that were produced within research programs supported by the National Defense Research Committee, which is the US body which coordinated the industrial military research during World War. And the images here show television pictures transmitted from the head of a missile to a so-called mother plane from which the bomb with the integrated TV camera was launched. Less surprising probably uh, are CCTV applications for traffic surveillance, such as here in this example from Lausanne, Switzerland, where television surveillance of traffic in the city center was implemented in the mid 1960s. And the mid 1960s constitute kind of a turning point in Europe because that's when um, these uh, um, CCTV systems for traffic surveillance started to pop up in numerous cities. CCTV furthermore promised to revive the rather old project of two way television communication. CCTV also embraced ed educational uses, here for instance used to transmit an enlarged view of scientific or medical experiments to students at the back of a large auditorium. And related to this educational use, CCTV was employed in scientific contexts, for instance here at the CERN, where the handling of dangerous materials were, was made possible thanks to the so-called telemanipulator, a man-machine assemblage that uses CCTV to bridge the distance between the operator and the laboratory. So in short, as a tool for control, surveillance, command, teaching and remote observation, the closed circuit systems would fit in almost every non-domestic space. For today's presentation, I start with this short overview of CCTV's flexibility and pervasiveness in multiple contexts in order to emphasize two aspects of its history, which seem particularly re relevant for the discussion of outliers in TV studies. 
And so first, I would like to argue that the history of closed circuit television not only constitutes one of the forgotten parts of television historiography, but that it, is, that it invites and actually I could say it forces us to radically revise common understandings of television as a domestic mass media conceived according to the broadcasting model. Obviously, this call for revision is not entirely new, and scholars such as Anna McCarty have already emphasized the multiplicity of televisual sites and the medium's role in structuring public and semi-public spaces. However, the domestic model continues to exist as a matrix, a paradigm of TV. It often remains a reference reference point against which other forms of televisuality are gauged. It seems to me that CCTV's long and diverse history allows a decentering that helps to rethink our matrices and frames of reference. And second, related to that, I argue that this other form of televisuality should be understood as a useful medium which develops in parallel to and concomitant with broadcasting TV. Scholars such as Markus Stauf and more recently Kate Hughes with her brilliant analysis of television in the corporate context have shown the value of, ex of expanding television's history to the medium's useful applications. And I draw upon their, uh, their scholarship to use the notion of useful TV as a way to embrace CCTV in its multiplicity. And to make my point, I will start by going back to the interwar period and to what I see as the early history of CCTV. So as you know, at the outbreak of World War II, television services had opened in the US and in Europe and the commercialization of television as a domestic media had been prepared in several countries since the 1930s. In other words, the years leading to the war see the launching of what should become the most dominant use of television, which would define most of its media, ide media identity up until today, namely the program-based, commercially or public-funded broadcasting into domestic spaces. However, television's interwar period is not only important for understanding the origins of institutional frameworks that would become dominant in the post-war period, but also since it reveals the broad range of televisual forms that were imagined and developed. As research inspired by media archaeological approaches has highlighted, television in the interwar period was hybrid, intermedial and multiform. These pictures here from interwar Germany document this hybridity, including the bidirectional communication device on the right and on the left, a large screen theater TV. So the photograph on the left was taken at the Berlin Radio Fair in 1935, so an industrial exhibition, and it offers a, gl a glimpse into the television Hall. And as you can see, there, um, uh, this hall included domestic receivers that were aligned on the wall, and then this large screen project, uh, projection system projected overhead. And um, I also like this image very much because it shows well that um, there was actually a large audience to see these television demonstrations. So contrary to a common understanding of interwar television as a medium without public, television was actually very much seen, at least within this display exhibition context. At such public television demonstrations, Closed circuits were also frequently used. For instance, here at the Telefunken stand, so erected at the Berlin Radio Fair, Fair in 1936. Um, and here the studio space and the reception area formed a closed loop, allowing the audience to observe simultaneously the performance on stage behind uh, the, the the glass windows and its transmission on screen in front of the small TV sets. The closed circuit here was part of television in the making and allowed the audience to verify the authenticity and liveness of the televisual picture, as well as the good functioning of the small TV set. While such interwar closed circuits deserved the familiarization and institutionalization of broadcasting TV, a new closed circuit dispositive emerged during World War II, and the closed circuit uh, T and closed circuit TV was henceforth explicitly conceived as the other or the alternative to broadcasting television. 
In an emblematic introduction to CCTV published in the mid 1950s, author Edward Knoll um, summarizes this fundamental difference between the broadcasting and the closed circuit model. And so he writes, entertainment television has flourished for over a decade. The growth has been so phenomenal that various other applications for television remain relatively unexplored. For the last few years, manufacturers have been designing equipment equipment specifically for uses other than that of commercial telecasting. Television cameras and viewers can perform hundreds of functions cheaply, safely, quickly, and conveniently. Applications can be found today in industrial plants, business establishments, stores, shops, all levels of government, education, and even the home. This television that the author describes here is multifaceted, plural, and highly flexible. It is to be found almost everywhere, in home, but also out of home. And while the so-called commercial telecasting is here reduced to its entertainment function, CCTV is, according to Noel, a truly universal medium, which does almost everything in the most appropriate manner. Paradoxically, this broad range of possible applications that Noel describes resulted from the application's closed design. And this closed design, and this is the second aspect of CCTV's long history that I would like to highlight today, so this closed close design was actually linked to wartime research. Indeed, the existence of the broadcasting other, so this alternative form of television, was contingent upon the collaboration of militaries and private corporations during World War II and on the influx of new money and new requirements into television research. In television history, World War II remains a somewhat unexplored parenthesis between the interwar and the post-war period. The war years are often understood as an interruption of research on domestic television and thus as an, uh, as an interruption of television's conquest of the living room. When I started having a closer look at the television activities of firms such as RCA, the Radio Corporation of America, I realized that there was actually a lot going on while the so-called war effort certainly brought to a halt certain domains of industrial research and development, others were highly stimulated. So to stick with RCA, it is notable that over the course of the war, RCA presented three different televisual equipments built into guided miss missiles, respectively conceived as a reconnaissance system. So the guided missile system is what you see here uh, in this publication from uh, 64. Um, distinct with regard to picture quality and function, these uh, missiles or reconnaissance systems shared uh, major characteristics that's, that's distinguished military TV, TV from the medium's broadcasting forms. And so these differences between military TV and uh, broadcasting TV include first major rate reduction from equipment weighing several tons to an entire system of around one, uh, 150 pounds, according to RCA's own sources. Simultaneously, the new designs strove towards miniaturization of the devices and RCA's president, David Sarnoff, writes in a paper published also just after the war when he tried to boost his company's war-related achievements. So he writes, television pickup and transmitting equipment that once might have filled a large room was redesigned, modified and built to suitcase compactness for military uses. Um, sorry. The reference to the suitcase size of cameras, transmitters and receivers became a new standard, which signaled the aptitude of equipment for military use. Furthermore, contrary to the civilian televisual systems in development in the 1930s, military TV was not handled by RCA specialists, but by military personnel. The overall ease of operation and of maintenance was thus really important. And then last and importantly to my argument, all these military applications were based on the conception of television as a closed circuit, transferring visual data from the camera to one signal receiver. The closed circuit guaranteed the functioning of the targeting or the surveillance operation. It enabled the target's distant view for the pilot in the control plane. 
Considering wartime television's limited efficiency on the battlefield and its technical restrictions overall, most historians judge the different military TV programs during World War II to be a failure. And contrary to what an overly enthusiastic journal article had announced in 1940, television did indeed little to actually advance the robotic battlefield. Yet, the publicly funded television research by private actors did have a long-lasting impact beyond the war. It contributed to the convergence of science, industry, and military, and it produced a new dispositive, the closed circuit, which would infuse multiple sectors after the war. Indeed, as I have very briefly mentioned at the beginning, in the post-war period, closed circuit systems promised to solve multiple problems, be they of educational, industrial or scientific nature. CCTV introduced rationalized workflows in industry, it facilitated medical research, and it was meant to smooth administrative processes. From the mid-1950s on, numerous publications were dedicated to these uh, broad applications of TV and introduced the uses of television in science and industry to an audience in the USA, but also in Europe. And so to sum up my argument so far, CCTV was a highly flexible assemblage growing out of army-related research and developing very actively from the mid-1950s on internationally. It integrated multiple spaces outside the home and radically diversified with what Anna McCarthy has called television's site specificity. Furthermore, CCTV certainly also is an outlier in television's historiography that has been mostly neglected by TV historians so far. Whereas its historical significance is all but marginal, its treatment by media historians is. This is not further surprising if we consider the importance of the domestic broadcasting model for television studies. CCTV asks for a resolute decentering from this model and requests that we embrace the many industrial, bureaucratic and other applications of televisuality as being part of television's history, which expands to intersect with the history of military media, of surveillance society, industrial automation, education, etc. To think through this decentering of the broadcasting model, I have found it helpful to turn to cinema studies and more particularly to the henceforth well established scholarship on non theatrical uh, cinema. For almost three decades, film historians have engaged in a lively discussion on the role, functions, and publics of the so called useful film, broadly defined as a body of films and technologies that perform tasks and serve as instruments. Shifting attention away from the feature film and theatrical reception to alternative uses of cinema, this historical scholarship investigates industrial, military, educational and medical films and suggests new analytical frameworks to apprehend this important but long time neglected strand of cinematographic production. Indeed, maybe one of the most fundamental results of this research has been to unearth the overabundance of useful films over the 20th century, and thus the multiplicity of points of contact between an audience and moving images outside of the moving theater. In this regard, then, useful film as a field of study is inspiring in its double role as historically rigorous and historiographically innovative scholarship. It shows the way uh, to think a television history that shifts the attention away from domestic TV and alerts the profusion of alternative out-of-home television uses. It does definitely help to decenter our gaze and habitudes and to reframe the question of what TVs we are actually thinking about. This said, it is also important to stress that useful cinema and useful television differ in many ways, beginning with the virtual absence of CCTV's early images before videotape. While useful film has been screened to small and large audiences seated to watch the movie, CCTV's role is not always to be watched. If we think of the surveillance or military image, we understand that images ontology is defined by the operations it supports and not by its rhetoric or discursive force. 
Rather than simply importing scholarship from cinema studies into TV history, it seems thus important to keep in mind the specificity or specificities of useful television, as much as it is important to reflect upon the contributions television history makes to a broader media history that includes but is not limited to cinema. As Kit Hughes subsumes in her study of useful television in corporate America, as it is been becoming increasingly clear, the commercial media products at the center of our histories represent the minority of media texts produced in the 20th century. As television historians, we may start looking at these other stories neglected so far. This uh, way, we may start highlighting the importance of television for, for instance, military media and early drone research, for policing in the pre-digital pre era, as well as for the production of scientific knowledge after World War II. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anne Catherine. Wait for you to unshare. Ah, sorry. So I don't have to look at myself twice. <laughs> so is uh, it okay? Yeah, yeah, that's oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, and Katie's back as well. That's great. And I'll also invite everyone else, if you're willing and able, to put your cameras on and join us. Uh, for the discussion, that will be great and really helpful for the speakers. If you're able to do that, that will be great. Um, questions, comments, responses, you can raise your hand, you can write in the chat, you can shout into your microphone and I'll come to you. What questions and comments and responses do we have? OK, I'll start then, which um, it's funny, Anne Katrine, when you uh, when you started, you were worried that um, we were jumping topics somewhat. But actually, I saw a lot of connections between the papers in, in, in multiple ways, one of which is maybe isn't the question I want to ask. Both of you have asked this question of kind of what is television and what is this thing that we study? But I think we talk about that a lot. <laughs> so and, and, and we might get down a rabbit hole if I ask that question. But it's been really useful that both of you have raised that and, and kind of suggested that sometimes we might limit what we understand as television. I want to ask about surveillance, which which obviously and Katrine connects to yours. But the example you used, Katie, obviously Gogglebox is obviously also a form of surveillance, which is kind of weird. It's not CCTV in the sense of, you know, it's not CCTV cameras, but interestingly, the people on it never acknowledge the camera as far as I'm aware. So it's not like it's direct address. I was wondering, Katie, could you, this connects to both, uh, both things that you were talking about. One, I don't know if you kind of wanted to reflect on the aesthetics or, or the style or whatever of, of Gogglebox in that way, which might be connected to surveillance, but also, because you started off talking about your students and in terms of their emotional responses, whether they in any way have talked about this idea of, of television looking back and the fact that they would film themselves. And you talked about TikTok and a whole set of other forms of media, which of course is functions. It's not quite surveillance, but visibility. And then connected to that, Anne Cantry, I wanted to ask about you about surveillance. You talked about the technology a lot. I, I was wondering, are you also looking at kind of the history of publics and audiences and the ways in which people might have been happy about or worried about the fact that this new technology meant that they became visible. So I guess in a way that's the question that joins two of you together is kind of thinking about the ways in which television makes the public visible. I hope that made sense. That felt like a lot of stuff. <laughs> Katie, shall I start with you? Um, yeah, I, I, I hope I noted it down because I was like, okay, <laughs> I want to make sure. Um, I'll answer your second, the second half of your question to me first, uh, which is no, we didn't really get that far in our reflections or reflexivity, like watching oneself watch TV in terms of the students talking about their practices. Although I do like that idea very much. Um, and I think, was it David Morley or somebody wrote something, it's very vague. I feel like there was a piece a long time ago in the 80s where people were suggested people were recommended to put a mirror on top of their tv and watch themselves and everyone was horrified i would be horrified at that um but i think that's a really interesting idea um so 
I might bring that forward to to kind of discussing how deep their reflection goes. In terms of what what they did with the whole goggle box aesthetic, and in particular, see what's interesting about this, of course, is celebrity go goggle box. So there is a real layer of aspiration, um, I think, in the celebrities. They're very conscious that they're showing their living rooms, you know, uh, and they're open for us to judge. And they're kind of they're well arranged living rooms. Most of them aren't to my taste, but they they are living rooms that have been assembled with care. So yes, as my students would speak to, they'd have some judgments about the cushions and et cetera. Um, but I think, uh, that was, yeah, so, so there's the celebrities framing themselves as celebrities, but they don't respond to the camera qua camera in my experience of it at all. Um, and actually one of them was on the radio, I think it was Fern Cotton, um, don't ask me why I was listening to her on the radio, but there you are, um, who was talking about being on Gogglebox and saying that, we don't know if this is true, of course, but she was saying that, no, the first week she was very self-conscious, but then after that she got really into it. And one of the many reasons I really like that clip, I know it's a really obvious clip in a lot of ways, but it's also so effective, is all of the people that we saw, and of course it's edited, you know, were really responding um, very viscerally and What's nice about that, again, it goes back to subject position, but then my students tend to be really interested in celebrities also, so that's kind of makes it palatable to them. I don't know if I addressed your questions as such. Are there good points of departure? Hopefully. Yeah, you did, you did, thank you. And Katrine, I was wondering. Yeah, thank you. So I, my, my first answer would be, I, I, or I, I would like to think about the notion of audience and publics within the uh, context of the history of CCTV. Can we really talk about publics? Is there someone who really watches these images? That is like a question I think that, that needs to be addressed. And if and, and then my like short answer would be rather than talking about audiences, I would talk about users and operators and um, uh, thinking about workflows and then and these man machine assemblages. And so the, the people play a different role that, than they do in a broadcasting TV setting or a broadcasting dispositive. Um, but then, of course, there is also someone that is targeted by the CCTV system, as long at least we, when we stay in this military or surveillance or yeah, command control uh, framework. And then there, what is actually really interesting within the military context, um, something that has been very much highlighted uh, in recent discussions on contemporary drone warfare is that um, the drone warfare and this kind of imagery and visibility that, is, that it creates is in fact the invisibility. So the targeted bodies are not seen, they are actually kind of wiped out within the technical system. And this is something that already happens in the 1940s in these uh, uh, images I've shown you from the 1940s, which of course were test images done without human targets. But then you can also see that the image quality is actually so low and the tele like this aesthetics does not allow to really discover or see something. It produces the idea of knowledge or of visibility, but it, I, what we actually see is not something that could be, like could be, it does not produce visible as evidence. It needs to be inter interpreted and read um, within a certain framework to then actually say something. And um, uh, the other, um, what I was also thinking about is that, um, uh, some parts of these within these uh, systems of CCTV, um, when we think, for instance, about traffic surveillance, these traffic surveillance systems, when they were implemented in cities, actually, of course, impl um, impacted the behavior first of automobilists who had to be trained in a way to use this system. So there are, um, I have sources about this uh, case study in Switzerland where you, where Swiss public television then uh, produces a program where they explain how the system works and they explain to the automobilists that they have to keep the flow of the traffic lights in order to be in, in the rhythm of the, with this new system that they have uh, built into uh, the streets. And so the, the CCTV system is part of this broader autom automatization of um, traffic and the tra automobilist behavior. So there is, of course, an interaction with, but then not the 
audience of the image, but rather the user of the entire uh, CCTV or the entire infrastructure. So, yeah, I stop here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. That sent us off in both of your answers in, in some really interesting direction. Elke, you have your hand up. <laughs> Yes, I do. Um, thank you both for really interesting papers. I was wondering, I was really struck by this idea of um, the decentering of the domestic space um, for television. And um, I wanted to take that and push that a bit further, namely by asking you, does it also allow us, does this allow us to think about the domestic space in less privatized ways? So, and on the other hand, you know, the workplace is actually incredibly privatized because what really struck me was with the TV moment, everyone was watching and having quite visceral responses and the visceral responses will lead to conversations, which means that even though it's a private moment, it will lead to something very social. On the other hand, the people watching in those useful television situations, we don't know who, who, they, who they are. We don't know who's watching us. We don't know anything. So the, they are really private in a way. So I was wondering if, yeah, if you wanted to talk about that at all. Uh, it's not really a question. It's just an observation. Who wants to go? And Katrin, you like Yeah, I, I, so I, I mean, I think, yes, this is, this is, I mean, a, a question at the, at the core of this kind of, also a little bit of provocative uh, idea to say, okay, TV with outside of domestic space, but of, because of course, one of the things that interests me very much um, to stay also with, uh, TV, with within Switzerland is for instance, when uh, CCTV is introduced in the urban space in the mid 1960s, television is still very much a new media in the home. So there is no banalized television in the mid 1960s in, in, in Switzerland where people were actually used to watch TV and this would be this kind of private, habituated media. On the contrary, it is still a media the same year when they introduce um, these uh, CCTV uh, the, the traffic infrastructure is also uh, held the national uh, the national exhibition, uh, so Swiss national exhibition where television and the broadcasting television has a huge display and kind of introduces Swiss population to this new mass media and its workings, etc. And so I really think that there this of course this the, the 60s 50s and 60s are very much a moment of newness be it for broadcasting or be it for all these other applications too and so also within this regard domesticity is not an evidence and needs can also be historicized when we look at these examples um yeah, that's a great question, Elka, um, and I like the way it connects these kind of like reframings, like what does it mean when we think of how TV is used domestically, right, in this kind of much bigger meta sense, so that's that's why I like these connections between these two. And I mean, it's so interesting because, and I also love this idea that actually the workspace is so much more private than our domestic space these days. I think that's so true. And it's something I didn't speak to is, is ways in which people now interact with TV, they live tweet, they they go on watching parties. These are all very collective experiences, immediate experiences, things like Instagram, on the other hand, in terms of capturing one's own living room, right? So these spaces are actually increasingly public even before these celebrities are showing us, and there's a comment talking about like, what's the degree of performativity with these celebrities, you know, responding emotionally. I think there, I think there's something there. I like to think their responses were giant, but what do I know? You know, I'm not looking at performance as such, but certainly if you are a celebrity in Gogglebox, that is part of what you are signing up for and you'd be aware of that. So I thought that was a really interesting observation because something I didn't speak to is, is the ways in which the connections that Lynn Joyrich talks about, many of us who liked TV got so much more into TV during the pandemic. And some of the ways we shared that is through things like viewing parties. And, and then my students talked to me about watching Love Island and like parasocial relationships and following those participants. Those are collective things, those are group things. So in a way, that, and they do produce intimacy. So um, the kind of stereotype of the student, which is born out of watching by themselves in their bedroom, you know, hunched over their laptop, 
that sits right next to the fact that they might be live tweeting their responses in real time and connecting with other viewers. And that goes back to fan communities and things like Television Without Pity, where people would really get really into long discussions. So there's always been that collective intimacy potential, I think, for, for TV. Um, but nice connection between the two. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, we're out of time, I'm afraid. Uh, it's only an hour long session uh, today for this. So I just want to say, um, it's been really interesting being encouraged to think of television beyond how we normally think of it. So thank you to both of you for that and for your responses to the questions and the good connection to the theme of the conference as a, as a whole, the outliers of television. Um, so uh, join me everyone in thanking Katie and anne Katrin. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. See you in the next couple panels.